Hello, and thank you all. Thank you all for joining this webinar hosted by the Academic Engagement Network. I'm Rafa Shams, Director of Communications and Programming at AEN, and it's my pleasure to welcome AEN members, supporters, and partners to Teaching Zionism on Campus, a conversation with Anant Wilf. We've had the privilege of having Dr. Wilf speak to us in person and virtually in the past, and we're delighted to have her back with us to discuss her experience teaching a course about Zionism at Georgetown University in the fall of 2021. We'll be posting the syllabus for the course in the chat for your reference. As you know, promoting the robust academic study of contemporary Israel is a key component of AEN's mission. And we're looking forward to hearing how Dr. Wilf developed her course, how she engaged with students from diverse backgrounds, and her recommendations for faculty who wish to teach about Israel and Zionism. I want to note that this webinar will be recorded and posted to our website and YouTube page for all those who could not join us today. I also want to note that we will open up the chat for participant Q&A after Dr. Wilf has finished her initial presentation. Now I want to turn it over to my colleague, Trey Meehan, who will introduce Dr. Wilf. Trey, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rafa. Um, as Rafa said, my name is Trey Meehan, and I am the Digital and Data Operations Manager at AEN, and it is my honor to introduce Dr. Wilf uh, to you all today. So, born and raised in Israel, Dr. Anat Wolf is a leading thinker on matters of foreign policy, economics, education, Israel, and Zionism. She's the author of six books that explore key issues in Israeli society, including most recently, The War of Return, How Western Indulgence of the Palestinian Dream Has Obstructed the Path to Peace. Dr. Wolf was a member of the Israeli parliament from 2010 to 2013, where she served as chair of the education committee and member of the influential foreign affairs and defense committee. She also served as an intelligence officer in the Israel Defense Forces, foreign policy advisor to Vice Prime Minister Shimon Peres, and a strategic consultant with McKinsey and Company. She has a BA from Harvard University, an MBA from NCED in France, and a PhD in political science from the University of Cambridge. Again, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Wolf, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, um, with AEN. Uh, so uh, today is especially exciting for me because uh, uh, in many ways now I have an opportunity to present uh, actual academic engagement, not just the various ideas and uh, books uh, that I've been working on, but uh, experience in teaching uh, the topic of Zionism and anti-Zionism on campus. So a bit of background, uh, this year I was the Goldman Visiting Professor at Georgetown. The Goldman Visiting Professorship, I think, has been in existence for at least three decades. Uh, it brings to Georgetown professors from Israel, but not just professors, not just academics, um, brings people from uh, government and uh, from general public service. I was never an academic. I mean, I studied and got my degrees, but I never actually taught. So this was also my first experience teaching. And I developed the course, especially for Georgetown. I did teach elements of the course in some workshops in the past, but this was the first time that I developed the full syllabus for, uh, for teaching an academic teaching environment. Now, uh, the course was called Zionism and Anti-Zionism. And I'll say a few words first on that. I think there was something valuable about being very clear and very direct in the name of the course, especially against the atmosphere. I mean, just this week, we heard about a call to get Zionist professors and Zionist students off campus. So I think there was something very important about saying clearly that we're teaching Zionism and anti-Zionism and not hide behind all kinds of generalized uh, course names. Uh, I think that was important uh, in kind of as, as a statement saying, okay, we're going directly to the core issues. You'll see also that in the syllabus, the syllabus continues with this idea of going directly for the jugular. And this, was, this began with the name. So Zionism and anti-Zionism. Uh, now, uh, Goldman professors traditionally teach seminars. So this was a seminar mostly for 
older undergrads, so mostly juniors and seniors and uh, graduate students. Uh, it was offered jointly by the Department for Government and the Center for Jewish Civilization. So I had students who came from very uh, different schools and different backgrounds. I had 10 students of whom six were Jewish of various persuasions, two were Muslims and two were Christian. So that's kind of in terms of the general background to the course. I taught it in the fall semester. So I just ended teaching it in December. And I will kind of go to the end already and then begin. At the end of the course, one of my students, a Jewish student, said that the course was more valuable to her than dozens of hours of therapy. Uh, so part of me also thinks that uh, a sub name of the course should be Zionist therapy at work or something. Uh, and I'll explain as we go why I think uh, unexpected, but why I think also the course had a kind of uh, a therapeutic effect. So how did I structure the course about Zionism and anti-Zionism? This is first and foremost, a course about thought. It's not, it of course goes through the history, but it's not a course about the history of Israel. It's not a course about the history of the conflict. It is a, co a course about Zionist thought and about anti-Zionist thought. So the course basically went with the principle of primary materials. And I think this was critical to the success of the course. And I will say that the course was very successful, certainly in terms of how the students ju judged it and responded to it and graded it ultimately. So I think one key reason for the success of the course was uh, the use of primary materials. Uh, the students did not learn about Zionism. They did not read books about Zionism. They did not read books about anti-Zionism. They read what Zionist thinkers themselves had to say. They read what anti-Zionist thinkers themselves had to say. And I found that this was remarkably powerful. And as we go through the syllabus, I'll explain. But I think, first of all, on the Zionism side, once you read what the Zionist uh, thinkers themselves had to say, a lot of what is being said about Zionism just melts away. The whole kind of sinister, land-grabbing, evil intention, Zionist movement, hell-bent on displacement and ethnic cleansing, all the things you read about today, they just don't exist. They disappear. You read the Zionist thinkers themselves. You read them against the background of the sense of disappointment from emancipation, the rise of nation states, of the idea of self-determination. You see Jews struggling with the questions of modernity, with the classic Jewish questions, seeking an answer to how to be a Jew in the modern world. Uh, I think that had tremendous impact by directly reading what the Zionist thinkers had to say. And also with respect to the anti-Zionist thinkers, it was very powerful because, and we'll go through it, the anti-Zionist thinkers, to their credit, when you read their direct material, uh, they tend to be very clear about their intentions and what they're really getting at. And as a result, it's very difficult to assume that it's just benign or uh, you know, something that's recent. So uh, the course was structured uh, based on five pairs. Uh, I'm going to attempt uh, a screen share and um, let's do this. Okay, so uh, the course was based on uh, five pairs. Sorry, the last mistake. Uh, where basically Zionism and anti-Zionism were paired. Um, so first I started with politics and this also flows generally with history. So first I started with politics. Uh, I looked, I started with emancipation to explain the promise of emancipation, why it was so exciting to so many Jews, uh, why it was so appealing. And I explained to the students that this is not anti-Zionism, it's just the alternative. 
Uh, it preceded Zionism, but it's important to understand emancipation uh, in this background. Uh, another thing that I would mention here, uh, each class was uh, two and a half hours once a week. Uh, and I would start each class with about half an hour of background in history where I would just speak, lecture, and then the remaining two hours with a break in the middle uh, were always discussions and student presentations based on the material. So it was very much discussion based, based on the primary material. Now, the thing that I emphasize here, and I think is very important in the background in terms of Zionism, is really to emphasize that Zionism has three parents and without either parent, it becomes, uh, you can't really understand it. So of course, one is the ancient longing for Zion, but this course really begins with the 19th century or the end of the 18th century. I make it very clear that the ancient longing for Zion is a parent of Zionism, but that's not what the course is about. The other parent of Zionism, and that's where the course begins, is the disappointment from emancipation. Uh, and the third is, of course, the rise of the idea of the nation state. So uh, the first uh, pair is emancipation, and then we go through the disappointment of emancipation and how it gave birth to political Zionism, Herzl, Pinsker, and others. The second pair looks at labor. And here we look, we again, we talk about the historical background, all the fermentation, the impacts of uh, labor uh, at that moment, the appeal of communism, of socialism, of Bundism to Jews, uh, and labor Zionism as the alternative. So again, Zionism and anti-Zionism, where again, we explain that communism, socialism, Bundism, sometimes intentionally, but sometimes not, were not intentionally anti-Zionist, but were an alternative. And again, it's important, uh, one of the things that uh, I emphasized uh, early in the course is the notion of a conversation of ideas and the fact that Zionism was anything but inevitable. Um, I began the course with a discussion of ideas in history with Yuval Noah Harari, with Neil Ferguson and counterfactuals. I tried to put the students in the moment so to have them be part of the conversation and to rather today, there's a tendency to look at Zionism as just this inevitable movement where one thing followed another. It was very important for me to convey to them the extent to which it was not inevitable. It was one of many ideas that Jews were wrestling with at this moment of modernity. Uh, another kind of uh, effect of that was, uh, I'm sure you know, when you read the early Zionist and anti-Zionist uh, leaders, when you read what the communists are calling the Bundists, what the Bundists are calling the Zionists, what the labor Zionists are calling the Bundists, you suddenly realize that today is not so bad. So I found that being part of this conversation for the students had a disarming effect they realized that the early conversation about Zionism was very intense and no one was pulling any punches. Uh, this basically ends the kind of more secular part and then we go into religion. Uh, we look into uh, the Jewish religion first, we look at Jewish anti-Zionism, we read the Satmar Rabbi, we understand uh, Natura Karta, again, this had an amazing effect because once you read the Satmar Rebbe directly, uh, one of the students at one point commented, uh, they don't care about Palestinians at all uh, because somehow they think that if those Haredi looking Jews are protesting outside an APAC conference, it's because of the occupation. But here they understand that it's a theological opposition to secular Zionism. Uh, so again, this was a very impactful uh, lesson and read. And then we look at Jewish religious Zionism, emphasizing that Zionism itself was a deeply secular movement and in many ways had to be um, because it rebelled against a certain vision of Jewish passivity, but then how religious Zionism develops and co-opts it and especially against historical developments. 
The fourth pair looks at Christianity as a religion. We look at Christian Zionism and anti-Zionism. Uh, with Christian anti-Zionism, this is the, pretty much the only time we go all the way back to Paul. We uh, read uh, Tom Holland's Dominion uh, to kind of understand why the idea of a destroyed Zion was so essential to Christian theology and how that manifests itself in the more modern secularized versions of the West. Uh, but we also looked at some modern Christian anti-Zionism and, you know, the Jesus Palestinian idea. The last pair of fifth, not six, really looked at the Middle East. Uh, we began by looking at Islamic and Arab anti-Zionism, uh, again, to show that it preceded the establishment of the state of Israel. We looked at the, at, uh, the Jews in Arab countries, the status of Jews in Arab countries, and then we looked into uh, the birth of the state of Israel. Uh, again, not shying away, we read the nation state law, the Declaration of Independence. We go into, and again, we read the documents directly, not about them, but read them directly. Here too, very high impact moment. You read the, uh, the Nakba about, uh, by Konstantin Zarek, the man who literally coined the term and wrote about the catastrophe. And this is highly edifying because if you hear about the Nakba today, somehow it's innocent bystander Palestinians who absolutely did nothing and were ethnically cleansed by these Jews who already had uh, tanks and F-15s in 1948 and went ahead and did that. And, and then you read and the Nakba essay by Konstantin Zarek literally opens with him saying, seven Arab armies marched in an effort to subdue Zionism and went home impotent. And you suddenly realize that the catastrophe, the Nakba was not the dispossession or was not, the Nakba was the fact that they expected to win, to subdue Zionism, to prevent the establishment of a Jewish state and they failed. And the catastrophe is the humiliation of the failure. And the entire essay by Zurek is about how devastating this failure is, how humiliating, impotent. I mean, that word is powerful. And then the second half is how to do better next time. Now, what do they, how should the Arabs reconfigure themselves in order to bring down Zionism? Uh, so I think that is also instructive. And the main message of the course was that what people say in real time is the most instructive. Uh, and then we went to look at kind of the Soviet uh, anti-Zionism and, and that kind of ended the course. We also had uh, a discussion about, especially after the Abraham Accords, of the possibility of Arab Zionism. Uh, so the possibility that in the future I could teach the course with a pair called Arab anti-Zionism and Arab Zionism. And could we envision the emergence of that idea? Is it already emerging? Now, in terms of uh, what I assigned the students to do at the end, first of all, throughout the course, all the students had to make kind of short presentations on the readings of the class. But at the end, what they had to do, so all of this is basically kind of historical. These are things that were written, most of them were written decades ago. Uh, but what I ask the students to do is to actually take something contemporary. So it could be a TikTok account, it could be a speech by a member of Congress, it could be an Instagram post. Uh, so the idea was to take something contemporary, something that even happened in the course of the course, and to do a genealogy of that. And the main message was that pretty much nothing that is said about Israel and Zionism is new. And that a member of Congress might say apartheid and think that they're being incredibly original and they're doing it only because the occupation has reached a certain point. But once you read about Soviet anti-Zionism and the fact that apartheid was already there in the 60s and 70s, uh, when you read about Christian anti-Zionism and how that uh, became part of a secularized West, when you read about the blood libels, uh, 
what you begin to realize is that so much of the contemporary debate is rooted in ideas that were written decades and sometimes centuries ago. And I think for the students, that was an, a very edifying experience uh, to really take uh, Instagram posts from the last flare up in May and to realize that they, they're all rooted in anti-Zionist thinking that is either Christian or Soviet or, or Arab. And, uh, and also they were able to understand how the Jewish debate uh, that took part in the early 20th century, the later part of the 19th century and the early 20th century, that Jewish debate, which unfortunately has been settled by events, um, that debate is actually used as a disingenuous mask for other forms of anti-Zionism today to claim that it's nothing more than a debate. When again, if you look at the genealogy of it, it really is not. So uh, this is kind of uh, my experience uh, and background in terms of teaching the course. Uh, like I said, um, during, uh, during the course, uh, I did not hide that I'm a Zionist. Uh, the students know that. Some of the students became uh, followers of my Twitter account where it says clearly that I'm a Zionist. So it's not something that I hid. But I think, again, the fact that they directly read primary materials uh, in many ways uh, kind of saved me from the issue of, okay, how are you objective in a classroom? Because uh, if the materials are direct and also this uh, format of pairs of Zionism and anti-Zionism, and again, giving directly voice to communists and socialists and the Satmar Rebbe and, and Arab leaders and Soviets. I mean, uh, I think that allowed them because they were in direct contact with the primary material, the fact that I was a Zionist was of less import in that sense. They could directly engage with the material. Um, but I do think that when the students said that this had a therapeutic effect, uh, I think it's precisely because of this structure. Once you read uh, the Zionist thinkers directly. As I said, all of the things that are said about Zionism just melt away. They make no sense. And once you read the anti-Zionist thinkers directly and you understand that their opposition is either theological or it comes from a certain history of viewing uh, the role of the Jews, whether in Christianity or in Islam, uh, I think that also makes anti-Zionism uh, appear for what it is rather than as some uh, benign idea that just happened because nobody likes Netanyahu. Uh, I think also by, by looking at the early Jewish debates, so for example, some people say that they oppose Zionism because they oppose all nationalism. So one of the pieces uh, the students read was by Rosa Luxemburg. Now, the great thing about Rosa Luxemburg is that she's really angry at the Czechs, right? She's angry at the Czechs, at the Poles, at the Ukrainians and the Jews, uh, because she views their national aspirations as a threat to the communist ideal. Uh, and she's equally angry at the Czechs and the Ukrainians and the Jews. Uh, so first of all, this has the value of showing that in real time, it was clear to everyone that the Jews were a people as much as the Czechs and the Ukrainians and the Poles, not something weird or different. So that in real time, the idea of Jewish self-determination seemed entirely normal and of its time. Uh, and also when you see the passion with which Rosa Luxemburg is angry at the Czech aspiration for self-determination, uh, this, this allows me to tell people, if people are saying that they oppose Zionism because they oppose all national self-determination, I tell them, fine, if you can muster the same passion as Rosa Luxemburg to oppose Czech self-determination as you do for Jewish self-determination, that then I have no beef with you. But I know about five such people in the world today. Um, but again, this gives people a direct access to what it really looks like when someone is genuinely opposed 
to all forms of national self-determination, doesn't just pretend to be. So reading someone so passionate about it uh, gives them a sense of what it's like. And I think it exposes those who pretend uh, and, be, and hide behind this claim uh, today. So that's, for example, another benefit of reading the material directly and understanding this Jewish conversation of the early 20th century. So uh, this was the course. Uh, I very much enjoyed teaching it. I, uh, the students enjoyed, I think, uh, learning it. And uh, at this moment, and this is also why I approached uh, AEN, I do feel that there's something here that's very valuable and I'm looking for ways to just share it with as many people as possible because I found that there was something very powerful about it. And at the end of the course, I told the students that having read all this material and engaged with it and thought about it and wrote about it and looked at how it manifests itself in contemporary culture, I told them that they belong to a very, very small group who actually know what Zionism and anti-Zionism are all about and have read the material directly. So I think also for the student's sense is that they understand now how far uh, actual knowledge of the topic is for much of the conversation that takes place. So let me stop here and um, I'm happy to discuss and I'll take out the, uh, the sh stop share. Okay. Thank you so much, Ainat, um, for that, that great description of how you, um, how you structured the course, your motivations behind um, uh, the, uh, um, the, the way you uh, um, contrasted Zionism and anti-Zionism and um, very gratified to hear that that had an impact on the students. Um, I think our first question is actually relating to the syllabus itself. Um, how did you choose the specific readings to include in your syllabus? Um, you're a proud Zionist, as, 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 as you mentioned, you, 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 were, you were very upfront about that with your students. How did you decide which readings to include, which, um, which promoted and also challenged the Zionist narrative um, in terms of specifics, since there are so many Zionist thinkers, but also anti-Zionist ones? So the key was that, you know, they had to be canonical. I mean, they had to be representative. Um, so uh, certainly for the Zionist thinkers, I was very much aided by the fact that Gil Troy had already collected uh, the Zionist, uh, created the Zionist reader. And, uh, and the idea was just to make sure that uh, they read the, the most representative, the canonical ones. So there would be Herzl and Jabotinsky and Pinsker. Uh, so that was basically the idea. I was not so much trying to unearth hidden gems or anything of the sort. In that sense, it's a very canonical worldview. Like if you're going to read about political Zionism, who are the thinkers that you, know, you absolutely must read or what are some of the texts? that you absolutely must read. And that was my guidance. Uh, and in terms of the anti-Zionist thinkers, uh, again, my idea was to go directly to the most important ones. So if you're looking to the Jewish religious anti-Zionist thinkers, well, you have to have the Satma Rabbi, you have to have the Torah Karta. Uh, if you're looking at Arab anti-Zionism, well, you need to understand you know, the Nakba, where that comes from. Uh, so that was, uh, the idea was just really to go to the most representative in each category. So you, you mentioned this a little bit uh, in your presentation, but we're curious, how did the students uh, react to your course? And did they talk about maybe uh, new perspectives gained? I think you mentioned the, the therapy um, earlier. And then also like, did, did they challenge you in any way? Um, so as I said, the course was constantly a discussion. So it's, it's constant challenging in that sense that all the time there's a discussion, there's a debate. Um, but, but it was not so much about challenging me, it was about engaging with the material itself. So for example, when we read the Satma Rebbe, 
Uh, I also included a very interesting essay that talked about the fact that, you know, right now that it's all a matter of time. The perspective is one of time. The Satma Rabbi might yet be right. You know, one day the whole Zionist project will blow up and he'll say, look, we always said that. So we, I was trying throughout to give every perspective that I was presented uh, its full kind of presentation to be uh, fully fair to what it is, to what it represents. Uh, but then I was also quite insistent on certain things. So for example, I presented the full scope of the Jewish anti-Zionist debate in the first half of the 20th century. But then I made uh, the very strong statement that to claim that this debate still continues to the present when the Holocaust in a very tragic way uh, ended the Bundist possibility. Um, so to claim that to be a Bundist today is just continuing the debate of a hundred years ago, I, I argued very forcefully, this is, not, uh, this is not a real argument because if you look at things in real time, the Bundists made an argument about what is possible, what is the solution to the Jewish question in real time. And tragically, their solution has proved in the most, in the worst possible way, untenable. So to kind of just pick up a hundred years later and say, no, it's still tenable. I argued uh, one of the words that appeared many, many times in my course was ahistorical. I talked about how much of the debate today is ahistorical tries to claim that, okay, it's just like we're in the 1910s or the 1920s. And I tried to make it clear that we're not. There's a difference between a debate that takes place with Jews uh, where there's no state of Israel, where the idea of a state of Israel is preposterous, uh, where the possibility of uh, being uh, true Polish nationalists with affiliation with socialism appears possible and is one of many possibilities. That's also why it was so important for me to drill into them from the beginning, to read the material with the eyes of the contemporaries, not from our eyes today, to understand that Zionism was not inevitable. It was one of many ideas and certainly at the time, not the one that appeared most destined to succeed. Uh, so I really tried to bring that debate alive for them. But then when people try to say that, okay, this debate continues now, that I was pretty forceful in arguing that you can't just pretend that history didn't happen, that the state of Israel does not exist, that the Holocaust did not happen, and that historical events did ultimately value some ideas over others. Great, and then um, the last question from, from AEN is, and this is actually um, a question that one of our um, faculty members is posting in the chat. What are your recommendations for faculty members who want to develop nuanced, engaging coursework on contemporary Israel and on Zionism? So uh, my recommendation would be, and as I said a few times, is go for the jugular. Um, I think we have gained nothing by trying to circumvent the issue or to try to run away from the issue or to try to teach it as part of something else. Uh, like I said, I found that saying, okay, we're teaching Zionism and anti-Zionism. Uh, the syllabus is very open about it. You're going to read about all of these people directly. Uh, I think that was incredibly important because uh, I think the students found, found it, in many ways, I think that endanger, endangered more trust uh, because not only was I open with them about my own beliefs and my own identity, the fact that I was so open about the course, about the material, about what it is, uh, I think that created a level of trust and the ability for the students to express their views and engage with the material. I can tell you, for example, that the two Muslim students were by far the most engaged in the course. They would come to almost all the office hours with a long list of questions. 
And the fascinating thing that for them, for example, it brought them to wrestle with a lot of issues that they found interesting, uh, questions of uh, religion and national identity in the Islamic world, uh, questions of atheism. And I mean, I, I also made no, I did not hide the fact that I'm an atheist. I explained why Zionism was a very secular movement. Uh, one of the Muslim students told me that it helped him finally understand many of his Jewish students, Jewish friends. He said that their identity never made sense to him. And now he understands their identity as Jewish students. Uh, he said that it made him think about the ability right now, Islam is not very uh, at all uh, appreciative of atheism. So the ability to be an atheist with a, a strong sense of national identity and a sense of being a people. Um, so I think by exposing them to people who were engaged in very heated and passionate debates about the fate of their people and the fate of the world, uh, I think it really also helped them engage with the questions and, uh, and address it directly. And I think ultimately uh, students found it, uh, ironically, this was more of a safe space. We think of a safe space as a place where you can say less and less and less, uh, but I think that was in a way safer because they saw how people argued with each other and argued passionately and were calling each other horrible names. I'm sure you know, the Zionist critique of the Jewish diaspora is horrific. Uh, again, if you read it in real time, you understand the context, you can appreciate it. But I think once they saw how intense it was, uh, it really created the space for them to debate, to question, to consider ideas, to see their relevance. Uh, and I found that it was very powerful. So um, I was looking here, there are a couple of questions that asked, we, we talked about how students reacted to the course, but uh, there are questions on where the, uh, how were the reactions outside of the classroom um, on, on campus or even maybe outside of Georgetown's campus, if any. Um, so, first of all, I was also uh, open about the course on Twitter. I put the syllabus several times on Twitter. Um, sometimes I would make a short tweet uh, after each class, like Zionism had three parents, blah, blah, or something like that. Um, and generally, the response I found was very positive. Again, because it was not name calling, it was, it was really just this real engagement with the material. Uh, on campus, I must say, the environment was only positive. Uh, I was told that Georgetown in general, perhaps because of uh, the older Jesuit background and their emphasis on tolerance, uh, there was no problem when I proposed the course. Uh, no one in the government department said, you know, maybe you should change it. Maybe it's too incendiary or anything of the sort. So I didn't meet any kind of resistance, opposition, anyone uh, raising eyebrows. I taught another course, which was entirely unrelated on politics. And the students knew that I was teaching that. And sometimes they asked about that and they were interested. Uh, so... More, more broadly speaking, I think people only found it uh, interesting or, or they just didn't respond to it, but there was uh, nothing negative. And, uh, and perhaps part of it is uh, the benefit of being a visiting professor. Um, it's not as if I had colleagues there that I engage with over time or anything of the sort. I came for a semester and then I'm back in Israel. So maybe things were said behind my back that I don't know uh, because I didn't really engage with the department or I was in a couple of meetings, but that's about it. Most of them were about masking in classroom. Uh, but um, so I'm not aware of anything and the students didn't tell me. I mean, I think the students actually only said that their roommates were fascinated when they told them their families were interested in that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, because, uh, because it was a real opportunity, I think, to engage with material that 
again, so many people have opinions about, but so few people have actually ever engaged with the real material. I mean, I'll admit myself before the course, I've never read the entire, like the whole Satmar Rebbe uh, material. This was not my uh, regular reading stuff. And for the course, I read it. So uh, the fact that they were able to get that very broad exposure, I think they appreciated it. Great. Um, I want to combine a couple of questions that, um, that uh, a couple of different faculty members asked. Um, how do you, um, how do your course address the issue of anti-Zionism versus anti-Semitism? And uh, did your course engage at all with some of the um, more contemporary forms of, of anti-Zionism in the U.S., say from um, Jewish anti-Zionist sources like Jewish Voices for Peace, etc., and um, also Israeli post-Zionism? So the course itself only dealt with it pretty much at the very, very, very end. Because like you see, much of the discussion about anti-Zionism is, is about reading the thinkers and kind of understanding them in real time in their specific historical moment. Only towards, I think, the very, very end that we read uh, I think one or two pieces, one piece excellent by Shani Moore that looked at Jewish anti-Zionism, uh, Western Christian anti-Zionism and Arab anti-Zionism and how they interact. And we had a bit of a discussion, but that was not the core of the class. The way that it was manifested was actually through the final papers of the students. And that was intentional. I wanted the students to grapple with it themselves. I wanted them to try to figure it out. So for example, one student ended up deciding that her paper would be about JVP. And she wrote a whole paper about Jewish Voices for Peace and showing how their thinking goes back to a lot of uh, kind of the Soviet anti-Zionism, some of the Christian anti-Zionism that, uh, that we've learned. So uh, some students uh, did, uh, uh, one student did an Instagram post for May 21, again, showing how uh, kind of the anti-Zionism that is just supposedly about Palestinian rights, how it's insidious, how it goes back to themes that are from Christian anti-Zionism and even Christian anti-Semitism and Christian Jew hatred. Uh, so I think what I really drilled into the students is, like I said, that pretty much nothing new is being said today. So that when people are telling you, I'm only an anti-Zionist because I read something yesterday or Bibi Netanyahu said this or the occupation is that, they are now much more attuned to what is the historical genealogy of so much of that. And once you understand the historical genealogy, then of course you also understand that a lot of it has anti-Semitic parentage, uh, so to speak. Uh, and I think that was the most effective way. Rather than debate in theory, you know, is anti-Zionism anti-Semitic, they could clearly see that, you know, if Rosa Luxemburg opposed Zionism, it was clearly not anti-Semitic. Uh, but they were able to also understand that when uh, senators speak in, con in Congress on apartheid and singling out Israel, and then you begin to take it to Soviet anti-Zionism, and then you understand that the Soviets are but the heirs of Tsarist Russia, literally the people who wrote the book of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and you kind of see that genealogy, then you can't unsee it. Once you read about the blood libels and you see another, another big term in the course was secularization of religion. So a historical was something that I said numerous times. Secularization was also something that I said numerous times. I said, certain things are established in religion. Uh, Tom Holland's dominion was very valuable for that, uh, but then they become secularized. So once you see the blood libels secularized, and you see the front page New York Times with pictures of images and you read the history of blood and children and sinister Jewish ritual murder of children, 
and you see the New York Times front page, uh, and you're like, you can't unsee it anymore. So I think this is the value of doing a genealogy of the present. So rather than I purposefully did not teach about anything that's happening in the present, uh, but the students uh, only did things that were contemporary. I told them that I don't want them to do research papers. As far as I'm concerned, all of the research is the course. I don't need them to do more research about Zionism and anti-Zionism. I just want them to take something contemporary in their life, on their Twitter feed, on their Instagram feed, and then I want them to do the genealogy. And then I think once you do that, you can't unsee the deep roots of so much that, that is happening right now. So there, uh, you, you had mentioned that your kind of perspective was understanding ideas uh, throughout the different pairings, uh, ideas of their time and kind of looking through that framework or through that lens. And the, this question asked, was that a challenge for these specific topics for maybe for the students? It was, a, it was the biggest challenge, of course, uh, because uh, this is why the word ahistorical kept popping up so much in every time I spoke, because so much of the discourse is ahistorical. So, so much of what I had to do was not as much teach history as place the debates in the historical moment. And yet uh, many, many times I had to emphasize again and again and again, as we were reading things, what is the historical background? Uh, this is why here and there, we also use uh, poetry uh, because that also kind of sometimes gives a sense of the moment. Uh, so of, of the moment of excitement, for example, about emancipation. Um, so, uh, I did as much as I could to give them a sense of non-inevitability of Zionism uh, and to give them a sense of really what is happening at that moment and what is the conversation. Uh, for example, when I spoke about communism, I had to really tell them, okay, we need to forget the Cold War and America winning the Cold War and we need to understand why communism was so appealing uh, in general and appealing to so many Jews in particular. Um, so yes, I tried to bring my best uh, theatrical qualities <laughs> to, to kind of give a sense of excitement, of fear, of anger, of like the emotions of the time, of the moment to place the discussion at that time. Uh, and of course, that was again and again the biggest challenge. It's also a challenge of words. You know, every time that the word Palestine appears, I had to say, I think I said it about a hundred times, when you read the word Palestine here, everyone at the time read it as the land of the Jews. Um, but I know that I need to go against the very successful efforts uh, that, you know, the fact that people read Palestine and they think Arab. Um, so that when, you know, when Zionist thinkers talked about Palestine, it, they knew that it was understood by everyone that this was the land of Israel. Or for example, that for Christians, the, the connection between the people of Israel and the land of Israel was taken for granted. Uh, so to kind of go and to, and to explain the extent to which it was taken for granted. You know, today so much is about, no, the Jewish people have a historical connection to the land. So to try to give them, them a sense of what it is to live in a time when that's not questioned, when that's just taken for granted, that's not even a point that needs to be made. Um, so yes, that a lot of the work was about, in a way, kind of, uh, fixing the a historical mindset and trying to place every week's reading in its particular moment. Um, so we still have time for one to two uh, more questions. So if anyone has them, please um, post them in the chat. In the meantime, I'll ask one. Um, 
Uh, you mentioned that one of your, your Jewish students said that this was um, a, a form of a, a, almost therapeutic for her to take your course. Can you go into that a little bit more? Um, what was it about your course and being able to delve into these sources that um, had, had such a positive impact on the student? So um, uh, I've written about it uh, by now and um, it should come out in about a month. I've written an essay uh, called uh, The Pound of Flesh and I talk about this phenomena where I think uh, Shakespeare had it backwards. You know, it's typically, it's not the Jews who ask for a pound of flesh. It's typically the opposite. The Jews are asked to hand over a pound of flesh and the pound of flesh most of the times is a metaphor for a kind of um, this figuring of the Jewish identity. And the idea <laughs> is that the Jews are forced to hand over those pounds of flesh and every time they hand them over, the goalposts are moved and another pound of flesh is demanded. Uh, to the point where I think today in some places, uh, Jews need to participate in what I call exorcism ceremonies in order to demonstrate that they're the good kind of Jews and they actually hate Israel. Um, and, and again, that's also the idea of the secularization of religion. Uh, we looked at texts that go all the way back to Paul, the idea of trying to get rid of Jewish particularism uh, in order to attain the Christian universal utopia. Um, so what I discovered also in some of my discussions with the students is that anti-Zionism operates as a form of bullying. This really crystallized in my discussions with some of the students. And like bullying, uh, bullying preys on a sense of shame and weakness. You know, if you're ashamed of where you come from, how you speak, uh, how you look, uh, then it's easier to bully you. Uh, but if you're not uh, ashamed, uh, if you do not feel weak about who you are, it's harder to bully you. And I think this was the therapeutic effect. Anti-Zionism, what I realized in my discussion with students, takes an emotional toll. Um, and it's the emotional toll of being bullied. And, and of having this sense of doubt of like, you know, I, what should I be ashamed of? And once you read the Zionist thinkers, as I said, so much of it just melts away. The image of like the sinister ethnic cleansing land grabbers, I mean, it's not there. So that goes away and the vice versa. When you read the anti-Zionists, uh, then also you understand where they come from and you understand that you know most of the time, putting aside the Jewish debate of the early 20th century, they do not have your good, uh, you know, best interests at heart. So I think for her, for her and for other students as well, it just kind of gave them the ability to withstand this anti-Zionist bullying, to, to just say, I'm not afraid, I'm not ashamed and just go away. Uh, and I think that was the effect uh, that it had, uh, a kind of, you know, a way to stand against bullying and once a way to stand against this emotional toll and that's why it's therapeutic. So there was a question about um, the, the use it says historical Zionist sources talk about establishing Jewish colonies in Palestine. And this person asks, how do you handle that, like using that language of colonies? Okay, so there were some texts uh, to the previous question of dealing with uh, the historical challenge of putting things in their place. So like I said, every time the word Palestine appeared, I had to explain how it sounded to the people of the time. But I must say there were texts that were so, I thought myself, okay, that would be too much to explain. So for example, on labor Zionism, uh, I was looking for some videos so that they would really get a sense of this excitement of youth, of, Brit of creating this new utopian society. And so uh, there was this kind of uh, video when it started with like, uh, the young coloni the young colonizer settlers of Palestine are now reaping the wheat. And, and I was like, okay, that's too much to explain. I won't show that video. Um, because I, I'm aware that at the time, you know, all of these words were meant positively and to say that these were people who were building something and were doing something, uh, but too much baggage. 
So I will say I, that here and there, if I found a text that I would have to explain every word, I gave up on it uh, and just searched for texts that I would not have to explain so much. Uh, but sometimes, yeah, you just have to explain, yes, that's what it meant for the people at the time. It had a positive connotation or, or it merely meant that they were purchasing the land and they were gonna work it themselves rather than use a feudal system where they let other people work the land. So occasionally I would have to explain it, but I do admit there are some texts where so much explanation is needed that I decided to use uh, other texts. And then I think this might be our, our final question, but it, it's a specific um, philosophical and pedagogical, uh, pedagogical question. Um, is your genealogical approach consciously informed by Nietzsche? And do you recommend Nietzsche for other faculty to understand the approach you took? So clearly no, because I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> Simple as that. So maybe yes, you know, who was it, Keynes, or who said that we all echo the ideas of people who are long dead? Uh, so uh, maybe, but, uh, and, and maybe. So my answer is perhaps yes. Uh, so for those of you who know uh, how Nietzsche relates to this and you think it's relevant, then by all means. But, uh, but again, I, I did think that keeping the contemporary issues out of the official syllabus uh, uh, was very important, but then keeping them for the student papers, I thought was, was really great because uh, this way, the students engaged in it in a serious way. It didn't descend into just some, you know, screaming match in a class. The class was kept very civilized and very serious and with very intense debates, but intense debates on the top, on the material itself. And then if they wanted to discuss, uh, you know, one student did an, on a graffiti on, um, on the wall in Jerusalem and uh, JVP or a meme, uh, someone, you know, someone uh, did about the whole debate between uh, uh, Rotem Sela and Bibi Netanyahu over Instagram and Twitter about uh, the idea of what it means to be a state of all its citizens in light of the nation state law. So they definitely did very contemporary things, but they did it in a rigorous way and only after they spent a whole course engaging with the material. And, and I also think that has a certain um, academic message to it, which is we're not going to go right in and jump into contemporary issues because contemporary issues are so informed by people who thought a century and more before us. We're first gonna spend a whole semester learning what they had to say, understanding it in a historical context, and only then we engage with the present and then it's more informed, it's more serious. And I think this is really academic. I mean, then the students really have a sense, I think that, that they bring to their present reality a certain academic rigor that they didn't have before. Um, we have someone asking if everyone got an A. I'm assuming no. No, <laughs> no, but, but there were definitely some A's. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so that will be all for us. Thank you so much for joining us, Einat. As always, it is, it, it's fascinating um, to learn from you, to hear from you. Um, thank you to all of our members and friends who joined this webinar. Um, we appreciate you joining can I, us. Can I just, uh, can I just yes. say that uh, this is really important to me. So if anyone wants to engage directly, to write to me, to email, if they have questions, uh, this is really important to me and I'm really happy to help. Thank you so much for that offer. That's a wonderful opportunity. I hope as many faculty members in AEN as possible take her up on it. Um, that'll be all for our webinar. Thank you all and um, have a happy Passover. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.